uh, to our Gateway Showcase. And uh, we're featuring two gateways today. And the first one will be vector base, and the second one will be sitsci.organ. Um, both of our presenters have asked for you to uh, hold questions or us to hold questions till the end, but you can put your um, questions at any time you, into the chat box, and we'll keep an eye on them and, and then um, share them with the presenter at the end. Um, this presentation is being recorded, and the slides will be posted on our website afterwards. So uh, with that, I will um, hand this off to Gloria, and um, uh, here we go. So Gloria, welcome. Thank you. And you can introduce yourself as well. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. I am Gloria Giraldo Calderon, Vector-Based Scientific Liaison and Outreach Manager, and, and I'm here representing the work of a team of about uh, 20 people. Um, our team has biologists, bioinformaticians, computer scientists, and engineers from three different institutions. Ah, oh, sorry, can you go to the next slide? <laughs> um, and we are from University of Notre Dame, MOEDI, and Imperial College of London. In addition to our three principal investigators, we also have groups of junior and senior scientists from which we receive advice, recommendations, and feedback. And our financial support comes from NIH and NIA. Um, vector base. Sorry, VectorBase is, is one of uh, 500 NIH NIA BRCs for infection diseases. And the BRCs are the home of genomes, omics, and other various data types and resources. VectorBase is the home of invertebrate vectors of human pathogens, OPATH database, the home of eukaryotic pathogens, including fungi, Patrick, the home of bacteria, IRD, the home of influenza viruses, and Viper, the home of, of other viruses. Like VectorBase, uh, these resources are free and not funded uh, by the uh, US, but I use worldwide. And this is the outline of the talk today. I'm going to present you an overview of vector-based data, tools, and resources, how to navigate the site, and what we have available. Vector-based is a database with, uh, which tools, data, tools, and resources can be accessed online. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, and the next one. Is that right? Um, uh, yes, my, that's the, yeah, oh, that's oh, the oh. one. Yes, that's the one. And, and this is the current front page. So at the top, you are seeing the website URL. And the, at the bottom, you can see the help desk address. We welcome any type of questions from either novice or advanced users. Next, please. This database is the home of genomes of arthropod vectors and pests. For example, we have Anopheles gambiae, the malaria mosquito, and there's a gypsy, which has been recently in the news because it's the vector of Zika, chikungunya, and dengue, yellow fever, uh, Culex quinquefaciatus, among other species of Diptera, Hemiptera, Theoptera, and Acri. And we also have other uh, species that are not vectors, but are phylogenetically related species. And um, we also have a snail which is an intermediate host, uh, uh, and the species is biopolarity of blood. Next slide. You probably heard me say the word genome. If you're not familiar with this term, only think of a genome as that uh, genetic information that is contained in the DNA molecules of, of your cells. Next slide. So if we continue with this analogy, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. That, that's the one. If we continue with this analogy of vector base being the home of vector genomes, we could say that each one of the rooms is a tool. And these are all the tools we have right now. Biomart, the genome browser, Blast, Expression browser, Galaxy, Ontology browser, Population Biology browser, plus the W, Hammer, Search, and all. But I want to use this opportunity to bring your attention to new tools. Sample Explorer and the Genome Lab Explorer. Specifically designed to query, browse, and download data from genotypes and phenotypes of population data. 
So Bacterbase is mostly being recognized for its genomes, but this is a new area in which uh, we are uh, trying to bring uh, useful things to the users. Okay, now a little bit, so that was the tools, now a little bit more about the data. So in the next slide, please. You can see uh, that we have partial uh, data or we have complete genomes. And this comes in different forms. So we have genes and genomes, we have transcripts and transcriptomes, we have proteins and proteomes, mitochondrial sequences, which pretty soon will be replaced by DNA barcodes and also population data. So what is this population data that I'm talking about that we are migrating to? Is, for example, insecticide resistance data, both the genotypes and the phenotypes, or any other biology, ecology, or behavior trait that you can measure from an individual or a pool of individuals from the lab or the field. Next. Uh, about these genes and genomes, so we currently have um, about 40 species in vector base. And what do we use this information for? So if, if you have these genes and genomes in vector base, we predict for all these species how they relate to each other. And we can uh, provide you with homology between these genes. Next, we have uh, the trans transcripts and transcriptomes. So you have your species of interest. You send it to a genome sequencing center. It provides you with an assembled genome. Vector base has, in the past, uh, provided with all the predicted genes in that genome. And in silico, we can predict what is the transcriptome. That means which species, which genes at any particular point or time are expressed. And for this in particular, so you can see in the slide, we predict the complete transcriptome in silico. But also, you can, in the lab, under different experimental conditions, produce selected transcriptomes. And we host that data in vector base. We also host microarray and RNA-seq data. Uh, and you can read in this slide that we have this data for about uh, 40 and more species. In the next slide, you can see proteins and proteomes. So again, we have the genome sequence. And in silico, we have predicted which proteins can be uh, expressed. But for in vivo data, for experiments that you develop in the lab, we have currently data for the malaria mosquito and the Gambia and the different experimental conditions for both partial and genome-wide, and also for the Lyme disease tick, Ixodes capillaris. Uh, right now, we only have one experimental condition for the species. In the next slide, I'm showing you mitochondrial sequences. Uh, this one I'm not going to, um, as you can see, there's a lot of data. But I'm not going to explain you much about it because we are now migrating for something that will be called the DNA barcodes. It's this idea that only with a set of one, two, or three genes that you sequence in each species, you can uh, identify them. And this is particularly uh, important for complex of a species, and this is very common, especially in the malaria um, vectors. We will be migrating to that uh, hopefully this year. In the next slide, uh, you can see our population data. So, as, again, this is data from the field or from the lab. So, we've been mostly recognized the 13 years of, of Victor Base has been around for only having genomes, but we are now starting to have this population data and especially useful for the uh, audience in the US. We are starting conversation with the mosquito control districts, and all this happened after the Zika outbreak. And they collect uh, would be uh, weekly or monthly data about where are the vectors, where is that as a gypsy, which insecticide they are applying. So we are working with them to produce this uh, Google Maps type of displays, in which uh, not only them but uh, scientists can see where is the vector located, which insecticide is being applied. So we are migrating towards this more public health side of the website. The next slide, you can see, so if you go to vector base, and um, there is uh, eight navigation uh, bars at the top. There is one called data, and it's the one that I have displayed there. So you can see what I've, uh, the data types that I've just shown you. But notice there is one called release notes. 
what is that release notes about? So if you go to the next slide, you uh, see that Vectorbase, it's updated every two months. So everything I've been telling you about data, tools and resources gets updated every two months. So we get the most updated publications from everything. And the data is not, is not produced in Vectorbase. Database is the data we get from the archival repositories, the big public ones, and data that you produce uh, as well. So, Vectorbase is more like a service, service provider, more than a. We do generate content, but most of it comes from scientists like you. In the next slide, uh, you can see how to navigate all these Vectorbase data. So, we have a search box, it's, it's like our or Google search box. And, and you can see that you can type in a query in this box and it will provide you all the information about your particular query. You can query about a species or a specific data type. So search is, is an efficient way to find and understand data. It is an index of terms, various fields, and site content, and is uh, organized in domains, subdomains, and species. So if you see uh, what I'm showing you in the screen, it's a filter results section. And it summarizes uh, how many uh, the different results depending on your query. And each one of those blue uh, links, it will take you to filter down and narrow down your query. In the next slide, uh, you, can, you can actually see that at the top in the right section of vector base in every single page, that's the search box. If you're new to vector base and you really don't know how to start or how to produce a query, you can just click uh, where it says advanced search, or you can just type an asterisk or a wildcard, and I, it will show you every single thing that is in vector base. And I will have you become familiar just by browsing the website. If you're ready, um, in the next slide, uh, well, yeah, thank you. You can see actually what you can use to browse the website. I have those bullets there. So if you're looking for a gene, it is always best to use uh, the vector-based gene ID, which is homologous to what gene bank has as the accession number. And all the genes have, you know, tied metadata. So you could just call them by their name. For example, I want to look for a gene called actin. If you don't know the vector base gene ID, we have a tool in vector base called BLAST. In that, in that tool, you take the sequence of the gene, you run it through BLAST, and BLAST will tell you vector base gene ID. So you can look for information for that gene inside the website. Uh, as I tell you, the database changes every two months. Uh, so for you, um, or, these gene IDs are kind of permanent, but unless there's a dramatic change of the gene, they will not change. In this slide that we're seeing right now, they said, what you can you do with vector base? I'm showing you a screenshot from one of the tools. It's called the genome browser, and it's the backbone of vector base. Why? Because we started with genomes, and genomes have genes. Approximately 20,000 uh, genes per species. So for every gene, every genome in vector base, we have a page like the one you have in front of you. For example, this page is telling you that we have gene RPL5, and later it gives you uh, COVID letters. That's what I told you before, the vector base gene ID. And he's telling you a description, location, he's telling you about the gene, the transcripts, and had a lot of uh, links that you could see towards the left and in the center of the page. All the data in vector base, you can query one by one, but if you're analyzing big data sets, many of the tools, um, remember the tools that I show you at the beginning in this layout of a house like. So if you don't want, you don't have to use search, but you can use batch mode analysis and tools like Biomark. And I will tell you, uh, can handle complex queries for as many genes as you want, and even genome-wide. But if you're doing manual things for a few genes, this is the tool that will, you will encounter with the genome browser. In the next slide, um, here's more about what you can do with vector base. So for that gene, for example, you want to know 
what is different. For example, if you're working with insecticides and you want to know after I apply this insecticide, the pressure of selection has made this uh, single nucleotide polymer presence of, or SNPs appear in different populations. You can visualize that with vector base or for your gene of interest under which experimental conditions there is differential expression or you can analyze not transcripts or DNA, but the proteins itself. We also have mass spectrometry data. We have DNA and protein alignment. And there's different data sets available for different species, but the two species with the most complete data sets are the yellow fever mosquito, which is the one I told you, is also the vector of Zika, chikungunya, and dengue, and for Anopheles gambi, the principal malaria mosquito, which is located in Africa. In the next slide, um, as I tell you, you can download the data. So the data that you submit in vector base and you can, um, or that others have submitted to vector base, the advantage is that publicly available. So you can use it for your own research. The only thing that we ask is that you cite vector base and the paper in which the data was originally published. But the idea is that you use the database to formulate your own research questions, could be hypothesis or not hypothesis driven, but it's a repository where you have all these vector data and, and you are welcome and free to use it and actually it's the purpose of vector base. In the next slide, um, something about manual gene annotation. As I tell you, vector base uh, used to predict all these genes, 20,000 per genome in each species, but there's some so much we can do automatically. And we rely on scientists like you to actually manually correct each one of these genes. So you can say, no, I'm going to split this gene, I'm going to delete it, I'm going to merge, or I'm going to tell you exactly where it starts and where it finishes. And we have a tool called Apollo, which is specifically designed for that purpose. In the next slide. Uh, I was telling you about this population biology and this map visualization that we have. And you can see many different things in, the, in this map, blood meal analysis and any other type of thing. This is under development, and this is something that we really we would like to value your, your opinion in any area of vector base, but specifically in this one because it's under strong development. What you as a scientist, but working in public health or doing research uh, in the lab, what you would like to see for this population data. And the next one, Next slide, please. Uh, vector base has been around for 13 years, and we hope to be around for many more. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And in my uh, final slide, I have uh, our email again. So if you have any questions about anything, or you would like to become a user of vector base, or you're already a user, we welcome your emails and we'd like to hear from you. Thank you. Gloria. Um, yeah, we can take questions now. Um, I'll leave this slide up for a couple moments and Nadia will have a look on uh, chat for any questions that come in. Um, I think we're a small enough group though too. If you want to ask a question, you can also just um, unmute your audio and uh, pipe up with any question that you have. Hi, Gloria. Thank you for that. Hello. Um, I have a question. Does your uh, gateway support REST queries? Like, can other uh, places consume your search, do searches against your data using a REST API? Yes, yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Uh, so if you send me an email to info at vectorbase.org and tell me specifically which question you have, which data set, so I will point you to the right direction. So just, just feel free to, to send an email. I'll be more than happy to help you with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Uh, this I is Derek. something in the chat. Okay. Hi, Derek. Hi. Um, I was wondering a little bit about the mapping um, application that you guys were still uh, building. If you could explain um, uh, what that's all about, maybe a little bit more detail. Sure. And also, I was wondering if um, if the application, I guess it's you were saying it's still under development. Is it open mm -hmm. source? Can we see like how you guys yes. are building that? Yes, um, uh, this is a question to the organizers. Could I share my screen and go real quick to Vectorbase? Uh, 
I will not take much time. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I just stopped sharing, so go ahead. Okay. Uh, let me show you that real quick. I'm going to open the first vector base. Tell me, share a screen. Um, can you see the front page of Vectorbase now? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is Vectorbase front page, and there's two ways to access this new tool. So here, Population Biology, or from the Tools menu, and you click there. And here in this front page, you have different ways of access the data. Collection Sites Map, Insecticide Resistance Map. You can search the data or this new tool, the Sample Explorer. So let's start with it. Let's try this insecticide resistance map. Because I'm working on my laptop, and most of you probably are, we have this tool here that will allow you to uh, maximize and have full screen so you can see the map better. And here in this search box is where you can type your queries. For example, we say, and see how autocomplete is providing me with data. So I can say Anopheles darlingi, I want that species. And it's telling me that species is here in the Americas. Now if I have these marks or donuts. If I zoom, see them, that's data from Colombia. If I click, it will provide me with information about the different samples. Um, and this information here, it will tell you what the color me colors mean. So the outside green, see there is a gray color, is telling me the species, and the inside color is telling me the level of resistance. Uh, we are going to improve this layout right now because it doesn't say, you know, which color is which, but it's something we are working on. Uh, that's real quick. I don't want to take more time. It's, that's a, like a quick thing of what Bio can do and searches and how you can manage. Do you have a specific question? Mark? No, that was that was great. That was a uh, that was I really appreciate you going into using the application because that really helps me understand what you guys are doing. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Gloria, this is uh, Ishwar. I had a related question. This is great. Oh, hi, Ishwar. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the the data set behind these queries. What is the source of that for you? And um, okay. how are you organizing it to support this query capability efficiently? You're talking specifically about these maps, right? The population biology yeah, maps. That's right. Yeah, and related to Derek's question on the mapping, because I think that okay. would also answer the other question that he has is, um, can somebody else use the data model to store this data mm -hmm. to kind of yeah. you know, so uh, optimally query this similar data sets? Okay, because vector-based uh, funding comes from uh, you know, tax money. Everything is open source, not only the data, but the code that supports all the tools. And we have everything available on GitHub. Where these data comes from is data curation. So we have one person dedicated to go to PubMed and bring the data to vector-based. Uh, this, again, happens every two months with a vector-based release. If you want to see your data in Vectorbase, uh, you can feel free to email info at vectorbase.org and say, uh, I'm writing a paper, it's coming up, this is, this is the draft manuscript, and I would like to, to have my data in Vectorbase. We'll give you a gene ID. So when you submit your paper, you can say, data can be uh, compare and browse and query and download in vector base and compare to everything else and just this is the link this is the id and, and we'll be happy to have, to have your data thanks Larry. That, uh, okay that answer your question yep okay. any other um, question i'm curious uh this is catherine hi um so hi. um I know your your role is as a community manager and I mean like outreach and coordinating that that um, so um, but it sounds like you know um, a, a substantial amount about the different kinds of uh, top you know the uh, genomes and whatnot that's the <laughs> substance of the website so I'm curious like how many people are involved have been involved in making this happen um, not mm -hmm. just from the technical side but from the content side 
Um, Because in 13 years, it's quite established, obviously. Yeah, well, you know, it it had changed. So the the model of funding uh, goes every five years. So in those cycles of, uh, it have changed a lot, but let's say it's between 15 to 20 to 25 people, but it varies depending on the institutions. And it's not always being these three institutions that are right now. At some point we had five. Uh, so so it, it, it changes a lot, a lot from you know, one financial cycle to the next. Right. I, I, I can understand that. That's the life of people being funded. Through. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Thanks. You're welcome. I think we could take one more question and then if there is any, and otherwise we can um, switch over to uh, Greg's presentation about SITSAI. <clears throat> Yeah, hi, uh, this is, uh, Ishwar, just one quick comment uh, to add to Gloria's. I think there's also a very active community participation that provides tremendous value to the to the gateway per se in terms of the interactions used, as well as support in some ways, you know, in curations and uh, annotation contributions. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gloria. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, so we do go go to meetings and have booths or present talks, or uh, we go to universities and teach one day, two day, three day workshops. So we are always happy to help you not only online, but in person. And and this year we actually also start to run our own webinars. Uh, so if you would like to learn how to use VectorBase and, and you or you would like to host a workshop, uh, we are also open to that possibility. So just again, info.vectorbase.org and, and we'll be happy to start a conversation about uh, training and how to use the website. It sounded like there was one other question that was about to come in and we, I think we have time for that one too. Okay. Yeah, hi Gloria, this is Nancy wilkins Deer at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Thanks for your presentation today. Um, I was going to ask so this about the size of the user base and also how you've seen things evolve over 13 years. Mm -hmm. The technology uh, well, changed quite a bit over time, and it sounds like you've done a nice job uh, meeting the user's needs. Well, uh, we use Google Analytics, and that allows us to see that uh, actually vector base is used worldwide. As far as a fixed number of users, I don't have that in the top of my mind, but uh, we do have um, different ways to communicate with our users. So we have an email list and we have social media, and those are different communities, as you will imagine. So the more senior scientists are the ones who join our email list, and the more younger postdoc grad students uh, join social media. So from that comes that from Google Analytics from phone that comes. We have about 800 people in the email list and about 1,000 in social media. But I, I wouldn't have beyond that a number of actually the user base. Yeah, so that's all Google Analytics, so people don't have to log in to do the queries or anything? Exactly. So from Google Analytics, uh, Analytics uh, I, I I not even know how many users we have per month. I'm sorry, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. But that's all yeah. the, the numbers I give you are just from our email list. And, <laughs> and yes, um, to use the website, you could have an account, but it's not necessary. It's optional because it only gives you additional features like the possibility to save your work um, and to bring it back again. But you don't have to do it. So that's why we don't know exactly how many people use it. But I could find that out, actually. <laughs> That's okay. Just curious. Thank you very much. <laughs> sure. Well, thanks, Gloria. I really appreciate um, you taking, leaving time for all these extra questions, and uh, that was really interesting to see. And as, as likewise, as Derek mentioned, it's it was fun to see the map and so forth and interacting with it. So um, okay. I think with that, we, yeah. So thank you. Um, so now we can okay. switch to, to um, yeah, Bye. you can <laughs> if you want, yeah. <laughs> Greg, you can share your screen now. Okay, great. Um, Gloria, that was phenomenal. Um, thank you so much for that that uh, presentation. I learned a ton and I'm very, very impressed with your team's um, gateway. Um, it's just very exciting to see that uh, user community grow and that um, informatics resource um, evolve. Uh, very particularly interested in your mapping, so fantastic job. Um, thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> 
Yeah, great, great job. It was fantastic. I learned a ton. It just got all kinds of ideas. So thank you. Um, let's see. I think I'm sharing. Um, let's go to full screen here, slideshow. Um, my presentation and um, my name is Greg Newman. I'm a research scientist at the Natural Resource Ecology Laboratory here at Colorado State University. And um, our science gateway is supported. We're very, very happy to acknowledge our support from the National Science Foundation and the um, Sustainable Software Institute program therein. Um, so kudos to that program for allowing us to do the work we do. Um, we have a very small team, um, not to the magnitude of the size of team of vector base. Um, there's about three of us and a couple of grad students. So it's a smaller, smaller team. Um, we're a bit nimble and agile in our approach and so um, I'll kind of dive into what sitside.org is, is. Um, but at first I want to kind of do some audience participation and I, despite being on a webinar I want you to think very closely and hard about this um, animation and think about the phenomenon this might represent so a little context this is the year 2008 and as the slider progresses we're going to move over to the left as the slider progresses from from the left to the right, we're moving from January through April, through June, and then on to September, and eventually back to December of that year. And um, our scale is a, is a kind of a, think of it as, an, as a degree or order of magnitude scale from zero to about point one five, and what that really means is high low. So blacks is low of this phenomenon, and white is high and red is in between. So if you're so inclined to play our game, um, join on chat and uh, share a few ideas of what phenomenon we, you think this might represent. Um, we just heard about vector base, so I'm going to put my idea forth and say this might be the prevalence of 80s aegypti, um, you know, occurrence throughout the uh, growing season. Any ideas? And Catherine, if they come in, um, can you voice a couple of the thoughts coming from our audience? We've got one that someone thought it was economic related. Another person thought it might be bird migration. Excellent. Um, so far, that's those are the only two who've jumped in. That's all right. Th these I'm are good ideas. Head, about it. <laughs> yeah, Economics is a, is a good one. That's interesting to think about. Um, you know, I, I joke, but these could be um, bike thefts throughout the country. <laughs> it could be any phenomenon you might dream up. Um, um, I think we have an addition of uh, pandemic progress. Pandemic progress. Okay. Yep. Good. I was thinking of rain or or um, temperatures or something like that. But very very viable idea. Absolutely, Catherine. Great. Oh, these are all fantastic. Um, and we have a winner, um, I, to not belabor too much. Um, this is, in fact, the migration of the Savannah Sparrow, as modeled by scientists at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. And my next question is less participatory, but how on earth do we know where the Savannah Sparrow might go throughout the year in terms of habitats it uses and uh, locations it tends to occupy? Um, throughout the year 2008. And how on earth would we know that? And one of the ways we do that is through citizen science. And so the, the only way we really can amass that much information about the Savannah Sparrow's migration is through the help of engaging the public in scientific endeavors. And so that particular model was developed by Daniel Fink at the Cornell Lab and his team by mining data from another gateway. Uh, friends of mine at the Cornell Lab pre created eBird. And for those involved in amateur birding, uh, naturalists, you know, and the like, hobbyists <clears throat> go out and they tell us what birds they find with their binoculars and they go out to natural areas and they um, report um, the locations of these species um, uh, gratis as volunteers. And so what scientists like Daniel Fink are able to do is mine and download data from eBird and then model and predict um, the, the suitable habitat and the likely locations of the species throughout years spatially and temporally 
given the uh, the large volume of data submitted by volunteers. So all of this can be wrapped up in what we call citizen science. There's a million terms, community-based monitoring, participatory action research, volunteer geographic information, crisis mapping, and the like that um, kind of relate to and crowdsourcing, of course, <clears throat> that relate to and kind of are akin to citizen science broadly, at least from our perspective. So our, our team um, asked the question, why just birds? And at the time, this is back in 2007, we have a, a life history, if you will, of our science gateway for 10 years, um, not quite 13, like vector-based, but um, we're 10 years strong and, and growing. And uh, we started in 07. And at the time, for the, the, the ecologists of the world, there was basically two gateways for two topics. Uh, there was eBird, and then there was the a project called Project Budburst for plant phenology. And I think, I don't exactly know when this started, but five years later, Coca Raz, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, here also at Colorado State University, started up their effort to um, track precipitation. So, so we covered three things in the world. We covered birds and we covered ph plant phenology, which is the timing of events like bud burst or leaf uh, green up or um, leaf color change. And, um, and then we covered precipitation, how much rain fell where. And um, I myself have a rain gauge and I'm a part of the Coca Raz network as a citizen scientist myself. So, you know, we, we crowdsource kind of the ability to get finer scale precipitation data that way. But we asked the question, why just these three topics? And so our mission was to provide comprehensive support for citizen science programs globally to allow and empower the community to measure things of local relevance to them that transcend and, and go beyond these three topics. Our goals were threefold to support the full spectrum of citizen science needs from volunteer management, different governance models, data, privacy concerns, um, and the like, and then also elevate the rigor of science, citizen science data to improve the metadata documentation and, and, and hence value of the data generated through citizen science for scientific and decision making and policy alike. And then third, to improve standardization, interoperability, integration, accessibility, and sharing of the data um, amassed through the phenomenon of citizen science. Basically provide a comprehensive platform or gateway where anyone anywhere can enact projects themselves and have the confidence that their project will be rigorous, advanced citizen sci or scientific understanding <clears throat> and provide positive impacts and outcomes, hopefully, of course. So this is our gateway and this is our homepage as of March. Um, this We had 385 projects globally engaging 3,000 members, generating over half a million scientific observations of on a variety of topics from plants, bats, birds, fish, maple syrup productivity, bike thefts, potholes, um, socio-ecological um, phenomenon broadly, largely ecological um, in nature. And um, we had master naturalists and nature centers and zoos and aquaria using this gateway to enact citizen science projects in their local local places. Um, that was March. Today, we are now at um, 420 projects globally. Just a couple months later, um, over 710,000 observations or scientific measurements and growing strong. So um, things are really moving forward. Um, on this gateway, you can search and query for projects by a variety of keywords and topics and order by the number of measurements they've been making by search for title or keyword or topic. And, um, and then actively quick, you know, join an effort. Um, as a, as a volunteer, as a citizen scientist, and or click on a particular project to learn more. Um, so once you do that, we have provide a basically a templatized but very custom, custom customizable um, project profile page. And this is where the action happens for each project. Think of this as your Facebook page for your scientific endeavor. Um, this is a place where you, it's your home for your citizen science project. And um, it'll list project managers, it'll list your details, details and descriptions, and it'll itself be a real-time dynamic dashboard for um, statistics such as the number of members engaged and observations made and locations monitored and measurements um, submitted and the like. And you can see team members and you can, this very open, transparent um, platform. But I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. 
Um, and then, of course, this template provides you with a series of tabs from viewing data and engaging and interacting on maps and tables and charts to submitting data, of course, um, to, to facilitate volunteer submissions, to providing resources and tutorials and templates and videos to, to your volunteers and guidebooks to guide their work and provide instruction for their, their volunteer work, uh, media feedback, um, we've got survey, to, to, you know, survey capabilities, much like Survey Monkey, but fortunately for these projects, free for use, so that they can construct a pre-post survey, for example, to look at impacts of citizen science, and I'll talk about that later as well. Research questions, analyses, and a forum, and 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 a place to ask questions and post questions. You can manage these tabs and specify which tab is first and which one's last and which one's active upon which, when a volunteer joins and sees your project profile page, um, they see that active tab first, and you can specify that by moving and moving up and moving down tabs and and hiding them and and very customizing um, that your background and making this your own. You can also manage members. So there's two different governance models that sitside.org supports, actually perhaps four depending upon how you look at it. One is uh, member-based projects, kind of like your friends only kind of approach on Facebook, where there's training involved, rigorous training on a weekend to train your volunteers in a particular scientific protocol. And because of that, you want to approve membership to your project and basically vet and, and have the gatekeeper role of who's a member of your project so you can ensure high quality quality data coming from trained volunteers. The other model is a more open science model. And in that case, um, you wouldn't need to go through approval processes. You, when you click a, a join button, for example, on this and you click join, you can just jump right in and start participating. And so in some cases, like Bloomwatch, for example, engaging volunteers to take photos of algal blooms for eutrophication studies in high alpine lakes, the scientists leading that endeavor a USGS scientist wants to, just anyone to take photos of algal blooms, so she doesn't feel that they need to, to be trained necessarily to do that, so she's crowdsourcing it under a different governance model. Um, other projects like Trout Unlimited here is very much a member-based effort where they, they actually take volunteers out to creeks and show them the use of water monitoring kits and, um, and train them in a protocol, and then they set them on their way, and we get an observation a day from a TU volunteer measure measuring water quality metrics such as pH, conductivity, salinity, total dissolved solids, and, and the like. So those are the governance approaches. Regardless, in any case, um, project creators or project coordinators, we call them, the mavens or the champions of these amazing efforts, um, start up a project and they specify to the system what they want the volunteers to measure. So this is kind of our protocols page. It's kind of what's being measured. <clears throat> and if you don't see what you'd like to measure, you can simply add a new measurement. When you do, you specify the type of information, whether it's an integer or a floating point value, um, whether it's a categorical value, a text value, or it's a photo or whatnot. And you say, these are the things I want my volunteers to measure in these ways, and then using these units. And you do that through a tool called our data sheet creator <clears throat> and there's a video there provided to kind of walk you through how to use this but basically like Legos you're basically building building up a data sheet um, piece by piece object by object um, so, and you specify things like species that you want measured or basically any non-living thing so any characteristic about a particular site that could be the number of water bottles on a desk <laughs> it could be the number of potholes in a road it could be the amount of maple syrup produced by a tree it could be the number of leaves it could be the number of salad Commanders, um, anything you want to measure, you can tell the system you want to measure it. So you specify that. There's also two different general approaches to the who, what, when, where, right? In the case of the where, we want to know where you found a particular uh, measurement and made that observation. And so the two ways to do that is either entered by user or predefined. Entered by user is opportunistic monitoring for like foxes or bats or turtles. And you don't know exactly where your volunteer is likely going to find that fox. And so they enter it by their user, you know, either on their smartphone, using their location device on their phone, their GPS, onboard GPS, or whether they do it manually on the computer or entering their, their location that they found that fox. Um, the other mode is a predefined monitoring location. Many projects like Trout Unlimited like this, where they can, as a project manager or coordinator, they can specify the monitoring locations to which the volunteers then go weekly or daily and make the measurements, in, in their case, water quality. 
And so those are the different ways to do that. This is what a site, a predefined location will look like. They'll pick from that drop down list that says location and it'll zoom in to where they are for confirmation and say, this is where you are. And so please go submit these, the, you know, these um, variables at that location. Alternatively, you can zoom in on a map and drop a pin and it'll dynamically load and, and identify your latitude longitude. If you're on our corresponding mobile apps, that will be taken care of for you automatically. And you can search by address and landmark as well and say this is where I found the fox. So that's the opportunistic monitoring. So once you do that, um, if a project coordinator has been doing this for many years at a nature center and they've been measuring, I don't know, elephants in, in Namibia or whatever um, for 20 years and they say, dude, I wish I had this thing 20 years ago. Um, this gateway, they'd say no big deal. They could upload legacy data in tab delimited text format and um, export from their data management, local data management system into that format and then bulk upload data in bulk and you'll be able to see those data right away on sitside.org. And when you make an observation, whether from in bulk or at a particular you know, new observation, this is a typical monitoring observation made by Thomas, some volunteer, uh, Trout Unlimited volunteer in back in 2015 on September 7th at the Latrinia Run um, Creek in West Virginia, I believe. And um, this is a photo that volunteer took of the monitoring location. And you'll see the beginnings of, but unfortunately not quite seen on this screenshot, all of the data that Thomas collected from stream flow to the precipitation last 48 hours, the weather, the water condition is clear, and they did report things like pH and other things. I just can't see that on the slide. So this is a confirmation page for the volunteer. Um, and there's a place for comments and photos and whatnot for them to kind of validate that this is in fact the data they submitted. And if they see a typo, they can edit it right there because they're the, the contributor of the information. So when all this gets amassed, um, this is a particular um, temporal analysis of two variables being measured at Boyd Run, a creek in, I think, Pennsylvania. And we're, in this case, we told the system to look of, at two of six measurements being made by this particular project over time. And it'll dynamically show this in real time, comparing air temperature and water temperature. And the system will automatically generate descriptive statistics, summary statistics, mean, min, max, standard deviation, et cetera, sample size for each of those two variables. And you can click through actually to see the summary statistics for multiple ones if, you've, if you happen to be choosing to visualize multiple variables at the same time. Um, you can do this spatially and explore projects across the globe. You'll see that we've got quite a good reach. Um, projects happening in many places, many, many topics. You can sort and query for the projects spatially within um, this system to say, okay, I'd like to only look at the Front Range PICA projects. This is a project near and dear to my heart, heart here in the Front Range of Colorado. I participate in this as a volunteer and hikers um, are engaged to hike to remote talus fields up in the high country of, of the Rocky Mountains and report a variety of um, characteristics of American pika populations um, and the hay piles they make and the numbers of pika you found and whether you saw them or whether you heard them um, and whether there were run, running water underneath the pika and a variety of factors scientists are interested in studying about this particular species. So this is a in the sea of yellow sitside.org observations. Um, this is then highlighting in red the pika projects observations. So then finally comparisons you can, in this case, we're looking at four out of 245 predefined monitoring locations for stream monitoring, Alaria Run 1 or 2 and 3, and Bear Creek and Beaver Creek. Um, and we're comparing, complete with auto-generated standard errors, the various, various um, air temperature and I think water temperature at those four particular locations. You can also do relationships and select what's the relationship between, in this case, total dissolved solids and water temperature. Um, and these are dynamic in real time. And then all this can happen on your smartphone through making mobile observations on both platforms. So 
What? Um, so that's kind of the gateway. And now I kind of want to talk briefly about the impacts of citizen science. And we've categorized these and studied these as scientists as, as being impacts for science, impacts for, for participants participating, conservation impacts, and decision and policy impacts. Scientific impacts include things like increased publications, increased data, increased maps, advancing knowledge, um, supporting and refuting hypotheses, and generating new theories. Um, I can talk at length about that uh, later if there's questions about uh, theory generation, but um, participant impacts increasing their own knowledge of the scientific method or skills, use of GPS units, etc., cetera, um, developing a better understanding of accuracy, precision, and whatnot, um, de developing skills, changing attitudes, altering behaviors, increasing, you know, biking if the climate concern, you know, if they've learned about climate change and are concerned about climate change with respect to the impacts on American pica populations, for example, they might be more empowered to alter their behaviors and, and bike to work more to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions along the front range. Um, increase social capital, improve so self-efficacy with conservation, things like restoring wetlands. People can actually monitor restoration success through the system, build trails, look at the impacts of different trail techniques, remove invasive species and track the impact of that removal, improve habitat, mitigate wildfire risk, restore streams, and these are just examples. And then finally, from a policy decision, of course, imp imp informing policy at the city, state, government level, um, and perhaps even agency-wide EPA policies, um, BLM policies, um, and national policies. So these are some impacts and how do we evaluate them? How do we measure them? These are some metrics that we're trying to integrate into the system so that we can do better reporting on, you know, all these things actually being being attained, are these impacts um, happening, and what evidence do we have to support them? Um, and our moving forward, looking forward, we want to kind of take what we've done and really amplify the impacts of these citizen science endeavors. We want to help elevate their game and make them more meaningful and more impactful for those involved. We want to specifically have an eye toward amplifying the impacts on participants, on scientists, on sponsors of these efforts, um, for communities and for decision makers. And so for participants, we're looking at developing some embedded learning. From a STEM learning standpoint, we'd love to start seeing more of that happen through this science gateway and better connections with scientists, increased motivations, increased engagement, um, changed behaviors, and better tracking of metrics of these types of impacts. From a scientific perspective, we're trying to improve our quality assurance, quality control proto protocols that can be done in citizen science through repeated measures, techniques, through photo documentation techniques for species verification, and through expert verification. So in some cases, for example, in the PICA project, we have people go from multiple teams go visit the same sites at the same time. Um, from a sponsor standpoint, we want to generate a lot of dashboards so that the sponsors see the impacts in real time. From a community standpoint, we want to look towards an eye towards social ecological resilience and public buy-in. And from a decision maker standpoint, really making this meaningful for agencies and end users of data. Finally, we're working on a variety of integrations through um, APIs. Um, I heard that question with Vectorbase. Lots of APIs. We're working with iNaturalist for species sharing so that we can get vet and crowdsource species identification. We're working with CyberTracker to do icon-based things to remove the dependence on English as we work globally. Um, SciStarter for marketing and, and um, recruitment for volunteers. BloomWatch, I mentioned. The Global Biodiversity Information Facility is a d repository and gateway for biodiversity information that we share with, and then I see change. We're working on sharing the stories volunteers submit on SITSI with that platform. So with that, um, Catherine wanted me to put in a plug for the next SGCI webinar. Um, please provide feedback here and join us at our next month, July 20th, for a presentation by Kara Willing at Cal Poly SLO and Jupiter Steering Committee about Jupiter. Um, and there's a, always a pervasive, always ready, real-time link for upcoming opportunities at sciencegateways.org slash engage slash student focused. Um, that was a mouthful, but I will end there and open this up for uh, questions if we have time. And uh, I'd love to entertain any questions folks have. We have a few minutes. And uh, Greg, I'm going to hire you to do my uh, hosting in the future. You're, you're oh. way better than I am on that. I like that last slide there. Um, <laughs> so you actually do have several questions in uh, chat. 
Um, Great. And uh, yeah, it's, I guess you can look at that now if um, if you want. I also put yeah. a link to webinar evaluation in chat for those who want an easy link to um, giving us feedback. It, it's like a 30 second or less um, survey. So perfect. Yeah. So I see several. Um, uh, after the the guesses on bird migration and whatnot, um, got some comments about um, do people share or publish their data? That's a great question. Our data, there has been publications, peer-reviewed publications made. Eric Beaver, a USGS scientist, did a metasynthetic study about pika populations across six different pika monitoring projects on sitsai.org, uh, downloaded the data cutting across projects, and did a metasynthetic study about the, the status of the species throughout the Intermountain West. Um, so publications are happening. Um, we actually do, moving forward, however, want to put put in capabilities for projects themselves to publish quote unquote white papers or gray literature themselves because one of the things that's part of science is sharing the learning that that happens and we feel that there's a lot of barriers to the peer reviewed process for citizen science projects and we'd like to encourage public themselves public self publishing their data and even reviewing each other's work which i think would be quite innovative um, we haven't quite figured out how that looks yet but we're moving in that direction um, do you have have to join the project to download the data great question um, it, there's uh, two ways to answer that I guess it's up to the project coordinator you can have what we call public projects or private projects public projects are just that anyone can can view whether you've registered or not even registered on SITSAI, you can peruse and view the maps and download the data because it's truly public data. Alternatively, if you're dealing with threatened and endangered species, um, you can lock down your project because of sensitivities to the whereabouts of those for like poaching and whatnot. And so you can make a private project. We denote that with a padlock in our project list. And so projects with a padlock are private and only members can access, view, download the data. Um, so great question there. Next question, you showed summary statistics. What is the process for making these? Um, what does every project get them or does the project manager have to set these up? Good question. They're kind of defaults right now. And so we, we've we kind of provided that on behalf of all projects. And we did so based on an assumption that, you know, summary statistics and descriptive statistics are valuable and useful and a good learning opportunity. However, we have had projects ask for more detailed and unique nuanced statistics and we're trying to plug in the back end R engine so that people in a more advanced way, project coordinators can specify and create their own R scripts, which would then um, kind of mash up their analyses in ways that are unique and custom to them. That's a dream and moving forward, we're hoping to do that. Um, let's see. Also a question at the top that you missed, Greg, um, on what framework yes. is built? Yeah, great question. Um, Good question. SITSAI is all PHP. It's open source. Um, we actually have an open source license on the code, but we failed, unfortunately, to actually put the code in GitHub, but we plan to do so actually within the next month. And we're working with the Texas Advanced Computer Center, TAC, to help us um, deliver some more scalable infrastructures behind SITSAI.org. And so we're excited to collaborate with them through the help of um, frankly, the, the Gateways Institute. Um, so that's the framework we use. It's all JavaScript, standard CSS, you know, HTML5, um, PHP type stuff. Um, we are looking into Node.js um, as we scale, if that's of interest to folks. And we also are looking at Symfony. We actually use Symfony as a PHP framework for APIs. And we do OAuth 2.0 for authentication for REST-based APIs in our mobile apps. So great question. Um, and then it looked like there was one more at the very bottom. Can the tools be used to measure metrics? Or sorry, can the tools used to measure metrics be used by other gateways? Um, good question. I'm thinking about that. Can the tools used to measure metrics be used by other gateways? A fascinating question. I absolutely love it. Um, we haven't really thought about how to make that more valuable and transcend, you know, SITSAI and into other gateways. Obviously, we use Google Analytics, but a lot of these metrics we I, I spoke of at the end there are kind of almost stealth monitoring within our own system. And we're finding that we need to do a better job of more robust analytics ourselves to it, how do I say, expand upon that you get free from Google Analytics so that we can really monitor use and behavior on our platform so that we could then self-iterate and self-improve. And 
and that's something that we need to do a better job of. Right now, these metrics are really internal and kind of sit size specific. Um, so great question. I think that's opening my eyes towards an opportunity, however, to really think about software as a service and an API that might be useful to other gateways for metrics monitoring. That's a really good, good idea. Others, um, feel free to take yourself off of audio. I know we're right at noon, so I apologize. I went a little little late, but um, other Someone questions. Someone asked if you have a contact to reach you later. If you want to, if you want to type that in chat, you can just put. Your yeah, email. sure can. Yeah, we do have uh, info. It's actually webmaster at sitsci.org, and I'm typing that into chat right now. And then personally, you can reach me at gregory.newman at colostate.edu. Um, and uh, now that I think about it, webmaster was such an which it dates us. You know, we were back in 2007. Everyone was webmaster. I think we actually would like to add info at sitsi.org. It's actually shorter and easier. So, but for now, <laughs> webmaster at sitsi.org. And Greg, um, I have a couple of questions. First, I want to let you know that a light bulb went off in my head when I was listening to your presentation. I actually have not been that interested in citizen science until I saw your presentation. And oh, very, fun. Very excited uh, for myself and for my nieces and nephews who are interested in biology and science. I oh, think this fantastic. is a really great platform. Um, I do have a couple of questions. One, can anyone create a project? Great question, Mona. Um, yes, anyone, anywhere can create a project. We're seeing using our analytics the 80/20 rule. So we see typical Facebook, you know, social media kind of web applications. 80% kind of jump on and say this looks great. 20% really actually make things happen. <laughs> um, but anyone can create their project. We had an individual homeowner on a lake in Wisconsin uh, monitor himself as an N of one um, Eurasian water milfoil. So that's truly independent citizen science. He was concerned about the aquatic invasive plant in his lake so anyone can do anything yep and then um second you mentioned that it's available on android and the um, apple iphone i just went to the apple um website and i didn't see the mm -hmm. sit side do yeah. i need that's a great question, Mona. It's actually really pretty poor search engine optimization. So it's really hard to find. You have to type in SITSI Mobile, but there's a link, a direct link in our website that goes to the apps page that talks about the release history of the apps and you can click the button and it'll take you direct to the store from the website. But a search on SITSI Mobile may find it better. And if not, I can send you a link. Um, for sure. And Mo Mona, what's your email address? Just so I can get it. Uh, I'll type it into the chat as well. And Perfect. then one last thing is regarding publication. Um, I don't know if there's something you guys might be interested, but the Open Science Framework, OSF.io, they do a lot on sort of open publication. Um, hmm. That's what they do. And so it might be something for your gateway to hook up with theirs when people want to do self-publishing. That sounds fantastic. I, I think I might even have a friend at that open science place, um, but I'm not sure if he's at that place or another, but I've heard of that effort. Thank you, Mona. That's actually a really great linkage because um, we're actually kind of in uncharted waters. How do you, you know, do you do DOI, a, a, you know, a paper and... Anyway, we could definitely benefit from their help. Thank you. Okay, I typed in the two pieces of info on the chat. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Mona. Appreciate it. Thank you for the great presentation. You bet. I'll, I'll echo that. Thank you. That was really fun. And um, both yours and Gloria's were really interesting. And uh, um, uh, it both kind of give you, I mean, hers has a flavor of citizen science, even though it's not, because obviously ordinary citizens aren't generally analyzing genomes, but getting a sense of, uh, disease vectors and you know all that kind of cool stuff is 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 similar. Um, so um, well, we're five minutes past the hour, which tells me we had an enthusiastic group. <laughs> and um, uh, so I want to thank you all for joining us.